Hello. Welcome to session nine of Living by Faith Today, based on Hebrews chapter 11. Do you have your coffee? Are you ready to repeat our three principles of foundational belief? Here we go. Number one, God is who he says he is. God has done what he says he has done. God will do what he says he will do. I hope you've noticed all through Hebrews 11 with every example, and it will be true again today, standing firmly on the foundation of those three beliefs is fundamental to the faith exhibited. Well, today we're going to look at only three short verses, and each verse is about a different patriarch of the faith. One sentence, and it, it's interesting to me um, that it's reduced to such a short testimony. Hebrews 11 verses 20 through 22. And each verse is about a, somebody different. We have Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Just one sentence about each one of them summarizes 38 chapters of living in the Old Testament. We find their full stories recorded in 38 chapters in the book of Genesis, starting at 12 and going through chapter 50. So there's too much there for us to go back and do much referencing today. We will focus on the three verses in Hebrews 11. But again, feel free, please, to go back and read as much of those chapters this week as you can, because their stories are fascinating. They really are. But the Holy Spirit just focuses on one element of their long lives in this chapter. And he does that for a reason. So we're going to find out what that reason is. Let me read the three verses to start. Chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Now, isn't that an, an interesting thing to include in this chapter of tremendous faith? There's a reason for it. Um, I, you know, I get a, I got kind of a kick out of it. I, I studied all week and I discovered whole articles, several different websites with long articles on what the word staff really means. And arguments back and forth. Was it a bedpost or was it a traditional staff? And just pe people building whole doctrinal statements on which of the two it is. Um, we won't be looking at that today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to say that at the end of that particular day, I laughed out loud. We really get full of ourselves, don't we? Well, anyway, so the first thing I notice about these three is something they all have in common. I wonder if you picked it up. They were all three at the end of life. They were all three right at the point of dying and going to heaven or going to the place of the dead in that day. Um, the righteous dead. Let's see, Isaac died at 130, Jacob at 147, and Joseph at 110. And the Bible kind of makes a point, if you read the backstory, that they were very old men. It's not like, well, it was Bible days. They were probably in the prime of their lives. No, they were old men. And their bodies had grown feeble. Eyesight had failed. Strength had failed. Um, and they were, and they all three died shortly after the occurrence that we read about today. So that's interesting to me. Obviously, that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to notice. I wonder why. Well, I, I found a few reasons why. Remember in Hebrews 10, where we started this study, the Hebrew Christians are having a problem with perseverance. They want to give up. They're being faced with troubles and, and persecutions and they're tired and their faith is growing weak and beginning to waver. And Paul says, I'm calling the author of Hebrews Paul, he says, you've got to persevere to the end 
your faith is growing weak, you must persevere to the end. And then he gives us these examples of men of God, people of God, men and women of God from the Old Testament who persevered in faith through difficult circumstances. And he's saying, if they can do it, you can do it. And here he's saying, you can hang in there and persevere right till the last breath of life with faith. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. Faith can grow ever stronger while the body grows ever weaker. You know, that, that right there meant something to me this week. I don't like growing old. I'm not enjoying that particular part of my journey. I like that with every decade I gain a little wisdom in life and, and, and learn some things and, and my marriage is better with every decade of life and just, you know, I love my grandchildren. However, the body's slow walk to death is not fun. And many of you have expressed that same thing to me. I know that a lot of you know exactly what I mean. For me, it started when I turned 60. Since I turned 60, every year there has been another physical problem. The body has just started its descent, its breakdown to death. That's the way it is, and it's going to happen to all of you the way it's happening to me. And it had happened to these three men. But what's encouraging is that their spiritual lives, their faith, triumphed at the end with more strength and power than they had ever exhibited before. That is really encouraging to me. I learned that it isn't necessarily how we start that's important. It's how we finish. Because we know we can start things with great enthusiasm. Ask any dieter, oh my goodness, I'm so experienced at this. I have tried so many diet plans. My patient husband just, you know, you know how it is. A lot of you out there know how it is. Um, I don't always finish them. In fact, I seldom do. It's hard to finish something that's difficult well. Starting strong is great. We're full of vim and vigor and vision and plans. Then the troubles begin and the grind begins. We get a little bored with our lives or we just feel like we've lost our vision and, or it becomes just more difficult. We just, we wanna quit. We wanna quit. And that's true for anything from a diet. I am currently on this love-hate relationship with Nutrisystem. Um, right now I'm loving it, but believe me, some days I'll come on and I'll say, I hate it so much. I quit, I quit, and I do quit. But you know, it's how we finish that matters. You know, I've discovered in my own life that I, I often want to escape my situation in life, not just a diet, but my assignment from God. Um, there are times when doing what God wants me to do is exciting and satisfying, no doubt about it. But there are times when just doing my duty, being in my po at my post that God has called me to is boring or frustrating or disappointing. And there are times when I have just wanted to quit. There were times on the mission field through when we were going through, you know, deep times of discouragement and, and nothing was happening and, and I wanted to quit. I wanted to just go home. Of course, there were other times when I wouldn't have been any other place. You couldn't have talked me into leaving. But those times are real. And, and even now, in, in my current situation, there are times when I know what God wants me to do. And it's, sometimes it gets hard to hang in there and do it. So I just, but I want to finish well. I want to persevere. And times of joy and satisfaction and, and excitement will return. Life is very cyclic, like waves in an ocean. And, and that will return. And in the meantime, I need to hang in there, persevere, do my duty with a smile on my face. Sometimes my only prayer in the morning is, Lord, make me a blessing today. If you can manage that, just make me a blessing to my husband, to my mother-in-law, to my children, my grandchildren, to the church, to my friends, just with the people that cross my path today, make me a blessing.
and I hang in there and just, you just hang in there. You keep on keeping on. That requires faith. I was greatly encouraged reading Psalm 55 this week. King David, the man after God's own heart, one of Israel's greatest and most beloved kings, really struggled along the way. He did. The Psalms are full of his struggles. They're very reassuring because he always finishes well. He always gets his eyes back on God. But Psalm 55, he's talking about a present discouragement and disappointment and disillusionment. His closest friend has betrayed him. He's giving him trouble with disrupting his life. His heart is broken. It's just, and, and he says, God, I want to escape. I just want to fly away. Um, I could relate with that so well. Uh, let me read these verses. Psalm 55, 6 through, I believe it's 6 through 8. David says, Oh, that I had wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. Well, I could tell desert. I could tell David the desert isn't all that great, but oh well. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Now, I've heard that expression that, oh, that I had wings like a dove. And <clears throat> there's even a, a Christian song with those words. But it's that taken out of context, and it usually means I would fly to God. Well, the context of the psalm is David is saying, I would fly away. I'd escape. I'd get out of here. I would just leave my problems behind and run away. So I thought to myself, you know, I'm in good company. It's okay. But David finished well and put his eyes back on the Lord and said, I will find my rest, my place of safety in God. You know, there are also examples of mighty men of God who did not finish well, who did not finish their race. And that is so sad. And it's so hard for me to read about that in the Bible. I, it's heavy and I get sad. I think of Samson. You know, his birth was miraculously prophesied. An angel of God came to his mother and to his father and, and with, with miraculous signs told them all about Samson and his birth and what he would do and what he would be. And they responded so well. They said, oh, please tell us how to raise him. Help us with this. We will do anything you say. We want to help him become the man God wants him to be. Um, wonderful. And Samson is start strong. But Samson was seduced by, by sin and temptation, and the end of his life is very tragic. It's hard to read. Another one that is a surprise to me every time I read it is King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, David's son Solomon, the wisest and richest and most glorious king Israel ever had. And he began his reign and reigned for many years as a humble, wise man of God. It's a joy to read. And then the Bible says, in his old age, he was seduced by temptation and he finished his race weak, weak and wavering. And it's sad to see. So the author of Hebrews is saying, look to the people who finished well, who hung in there, who persevered, who kept their eyes on God, and just kept on keeping on and do what they did. If they could make it, you can make it. But believe me, there's many rewards along the way as well. A big one when we get to heaven, but there's rewards along the way. It's not always the slew of despond in the Christian life. Sometimes it's, it's quite glorious, but hang in there and persevere. Another interesting truth that these three men have in common is that they based their faith, as we've seen in other examples, on invisible truth, on something in the future that had not yet happened in their lifetime. And here they were taking their last breath and it hadn't happened. And instead of dying disillusioned, disappointed, thinking it all dies with them, God gave me that promise of, of a promised land and, and of a Messiah and of, of his deliverance for his people and it never happened and they would die disappointed and disillusioned, a, the death of a dream. But they didn't because they saw beyond today. They saw that God's word is, goes way beyond their own life.
that encourages me a great deal as well. I think of many things that God has promised me in his word or in my heart that I'm praying for all the time and I don't see yet. And it could be, of course, that God will answer those prayers in a way that I'm, it's going to be unrecognizable. He knows what's best. But there's nothing happening in this life yet. But I believe God will honor his word. And I don't have to be here. Once I'm gone, his word still prevails and his plan still prevails. And these three men understood that and God said, well done. That's what I'm looking for. Even though you've made mistakes along the way, all three of you, I'm putting you in my hall of fame and faith because you persevered to the end. You put your faith in invisible future realities from my word. We all have the opportunity to do that all the time. And it's, that's what God calls faith. Let's take a closer look at each one just briefly. We read in verse 20, by faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. You know, that's an interesting example. That's the one where Rebekah and Jacob fooled Isaac. They dressed uh, Jacob up as Esau so that he would get the blessing instead of Esau because Esau was the older son and the blessing by culture should have gone to Esau. But here's the interesting thing. God had told Rebekah years before that that promise would be inherited by Jacob, that the younger would receive that promise and that that younger was Jacob. She knew it and Jacob knew it, I'm sure, and Isaac knew it. So I think the greater sin here is Isaac's actually because he was trying to manipulate and fool God and get his own way. He liked Esau better. The Bible's clear about that. He favored his son Esau and wanted Esau to get that blessing, even though God had told him Jacob was supposed to have it. Well, Jacob fools him, comes in, pretends to be Esau, and gets that blessing, that huge promise that those simple words all the way through the patriarchs to son, to son, to son, carries with it, with it the promise of the promised land, of future deliverance, of the Messiah and eternal salvation. It's all in there. That's why that promise was so important to believe and to speak and to pass on to their children. Well, Jacob did get the promise as God had already always planned. Um, and this is where Isaac's faith comes in. His, we'll call it his old nature, showed up right at death's door. So don't think you'll ever be free of that. And he tries to manipulate the situation to his own way. But when that didn't work, and Jacob got the promised blessing the way he was supposed to, says Esau wailed and cried and begged his father to change it and culturally I discovered he could have switched it back but he didn't even though it hurt his own heart and it wasn't his way he said this was God's word to me this was God's plan all along and it will stand what I have said I will stand it's what God planned and it will happen. So his faith came through at the end and he spoke and acknowledged and confirmed God's truth, even though none of it had come to pass yet. And God says, in spite of, in spite of the trickery, in spite of the desire to, to get things his own way and change the outcome, at the very end, God says, your faith in me and in my future promise prevailed, well done. You're going in my hall of fame and faith for that. Isn't that amazing? You know, God is not looking for perfection all the time in us. I think in present day Christianity, we're, we're just, we have that mentality that we're supposed to be good little Christians all the time. Well, A, we are. <laughs> but B, we can't be. 
it just doesn't happen. I, I'm fond of saying about some other people in other situations, it isn't can't and it isn't won't, it just isn't. It isn't gonna happen. And God knows that and that's not what he looks at when he measures us and rewards us, he looks at our faith. And that can come shining through with the last breath of life. That's encouraging to me. Well, our next example is verse 21. Again, this long, fascinating life recorded in, in Genesis. And we have one verse in Hebrews 11, focusing on his faith. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. I had a huge study prepared on that verse, but all I'm going to tell you today in this moment is that, again, it was the same thing. He had, he believed God. After a long life of faltering, shall we say, falling back, two steps backward for every step forward with God in Jacob's life. It's both an discouraging and encouraging to read, if that makes any sense. But he learned that God's word is what prevails that God's word is what will come to pass. And God had revealed to him in some way what the future for each one of Joseph's sons would be and what the future of the nation of Israel through those sons would be. And that is what he spoke. And it didn't necessarily match what was in his own heart because some of the words were a little bit harsh and he loved these boys. But he had learned that what God has planned and what God has spoken is true whether I can understand it or see it today or not and that is what he proclaimed over those boys and that is what eventually came to pass and again God says well done and it's interesting he switched his hands over two of Joseph's two of Joseph's sons which were included in the blessing um, Manasseh and Ephraim because again the, he knew that God wanted the blessing to go through the younger. And the blessing went through the right hand. And so he put his right hand on the head of the younger and passed the main blessing on to him. And Joseph said, no, 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 Father, you goofed. <laughs> you goofed. Do it again. Because again, remember, culturally, you could redo it. But Jacob had learned his lesson, and he said, no. This is God's word, God's promise, even though we don't understand it and it hasn't come to pass yet. I believe God's words and what I have said, I have said. Interesting. And I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Again, the story is long and interesting. Read it. And then we have verse 22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. That to me is interesting. And you know, I'll admit, other times when I've taught this chapter, I've skipped over these three verses. I haven't taught on them. Talk about, don't we get full of ourselves? My thoughts have been, there's nothing there. That's not important. We'll skip over those three men. How I could ever think that anything included in God's word was unimportant, I don't know. And especially examples given to us in chapter 11 of Hebrews. This time the Holy Spirit didn't let me skip, and I'm so glad. I'm going to read these verses about Joseph and his bones. And this is Genesis chapter 50, 24 through 26. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now there's some interesting aspects of Joseph's faith there that I think we need to mention, and I think that's why it's recorded in chapter 11. Um, Joseph's family 
his brothers and their family, they had grown by this time to be a, a little nation, by the way. We're not talking just 12 people. Um, they were living well. They were prospering in Egypt. And Joseph was reigning there like a king. Uh, there was no reason to say, you know, you're going to leave here. Some versions don't say God will visit you. They say God will deliver you. Interesting. So perhaps Joseph, if part of what he could see in the future was that there would be future problems. I don't know. But he wanted to be identified with the people of God and he wanted to enter that promised land when the day came, even if it was just his bones. And he knew it was going to be way in the future. He died for, I mean, his bones went to the promised land 400 years after he died. The Israelites took that promise seriously and they kept his bones and they took Joseph's bones with them when they left Egypt and all the way traveling through the desert those 40 years and into the promised land. And Joseph's bones rested in the promised land of God. So it's here because Joseph knew that promise. All these patriarchs knew the promise of God for a, a promised land and for deliverance and for a Messiah and, and the future of the nation and the kingdom of God. They had been told and they passed it along and they believed it. And Joseph said, it's going to happen far in the future, but it will happen. God's word will prevail. God's word will be true. And I want my bones to go with. <laughs> I, there's something kind of sweet about it, really. So really, I don't think these, right now anyway, my understanding of this is, you know, doesn't go any deeper than this. You know, all three of these men, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, in these three short verses, one verse given to, at the end of each man's long life, <laughs> There's so much richness here. Another thing I see is that all three of these men believed that death could not thwart the will of God. The plan of God would go forward and be fulfilled with or without them. They did not die in disillusionment or disappointment because they never saw the promises fulfilled. I know people who have died in disappointment and disillusionment because Things just never worked out in this life the way they had hoped they would. And they felt God let them down. And they died disappointed. We never have to die disappointed or disillusioned, ever. No child of God ever needs to die disappointed. Because God's word and God's promises live on. They will be fulfilled. It, it's really a wonderful thing. I believe that for all the discouraging years on the mission field, remember we had some good ones too, but for all those discouraging years, and, and we left, by the way, uh, without a lot of earthly success to show off. The church we founded in Aguas Calientes, the place we raised our children, it closed its doors. The, uh, the work we left behind in Ecuador, the reducing the language, not translation, reducing the language to writing, it was an unwritten language, um, and all the primers we wrote to teach them how to read and how to how to read the Bible. It was burned by other missionaries from another mission that didn't like what we had done and wanted to do a whole different work. Um, you know, we could have ended our missionary career in disappointment and disillusionment. We could end our whole lives in disappointment and disillusionment. But one thing I've learned is that it isn't the end of the story. We're all involved in the middle of a story all the time, all of us. And the, the ending hasn't been written yet. But I believe that every time I respond to God's promise in faith and adjust my life today on the basis of what God has promised for tomorrow, that I am empowering that. I really do. Um, I'm going to read three verses that talk about God. We can't thwart God's plan. It goes forward. So um, Proverbs 19.21, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord is what will stand. And Psalm 33.10, The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. 
And here's, I think, the best one. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not yet been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. If we believe that, then our little disappointments along the way become irrelevant. They're real, they happen, we have to work through them, but they're really not important in the big scheme of things. God's will will come to pass. We're invited to participate in that through faith. And it's really quite exciting. And it can lend excitement even to, to disappointing aspects of life. We are involved in the middle of the story, not the ending. We make our decisions based on the end of the story, what God has promised for the future. So to summarize, three things that I see about faith in these three examples, and we've seen them in all the other examples as well. Number one, they had their eyes on invisible truth, the reality of God's promise. They spoke that belief out loud, all three men, and they made decisions on what to do about their children and grandchildren based on that future reality, even though none of it had come to pass yet in their lifetime. That is faith. And you know, what, what have I learned? What have I learned personally today? I learn it's how we finish that matters the most, that I can finish strong no matter how old and weak and feeble I get, that my body will grow weak, my eyes will grow weak and feeble, they will, they will, it's gonna happen, but my eyes of faith can grow ever stronger until I can see with sharp reality the invisible things of God and his promise for the future becomes clear and strong. That can be stronger in my life on my deathbed than it is even today and that's a wonderful thing. I look forward to that. And I learned that my mistakes, my wrong decisions, even some failures along the way cannot thwart the will of God. His plan will prevail. And he just asks that I return, that I place my faith one more time in, in him and in his word and begin again to base my decisions today on his word. And he says, that's all I'm looking for. Well done. So until next week, bye.